Good afternoon, I'm Susan Cheek, and on behalf of Virginia State University's Small Farm Outreach Program, we would like to welcome you, and Thomas and Anita Robeson are going to be speaking from Botanical Bison Provision to teach you about market prep and bouquet making. Hello, everybody. I'm Anita Robertson, and our, our farm is Botanical Bites and Provisions. And we are very pleased to be with you this afternoon to talk about some of our experiences going to market, preparing for market, and things we do to make bouquets. Next slide, please. This is our agenda for today. We're going to talk to you about planning and preparing for the market. Um, before you go to market, you should get to know the place that you're going to be selling, whether it's going to be on site or a traditional farmer's market. We're going to talk a little bit about the application process for farmer's market since we've been through it. Harvesting your, your produce, your flowers, and a little bit about value added um, uh, products and how you would process, harvest your flowers and your produce, things you need to take into consideration for pricing, and finally, some marketing and um, building some bouquets. And at the end, we'd like to take your questions and answers. So please use the, the chat. Is that what you'd like them to do, Susan, for their questions? Yes, ma'am. That's perfect. Okay. All right, next slide, please. What we'd like to do is share a little bit of our background as farmers. Rob, do you want to start? Yes, I am Tom Robertson. Um, not really much of a, a farm background. I grew up on a farm, but uh, I, after I left the farm, I did 24 years in the military as heart surgery for fusion, and then eight years emergency medicine, and then eight years in a private practice. And I decided after my commander in chief over here told me that we were gonna start a farm. So we started farming and we never looked back. This has really been a growing and interesting perspective for us. We started out first as vegetable growers um, and then we expanded into cut flowers and now we have a small apiary. We have three high tunnels and we also do some value added products. And we've been farming now about seven years. Yes, and we were selected as uh, Virginia State University's Small Farm of the Year uh, because we've been really proactive and I think we've learned so much from Virginia State University's Small Farm Outreach Program. It's, it's been one of our most interesting um, things that we've done. Mm -hmm. So we, we really enjoy doing this and we're growing it. And having fun. Next slide, please. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time in planning and preparation. As with anything, the more planning, the more prepared you're gonna be and the more likely you're gonna have success. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is sort of um, our introduction to planning and preparation. Before you go to market, you really want to take a good look at what it is you want to grow. And before you even plant the first seed, you need to start thinking about your customers. How are you going to market it? Who are your customers? Who are you going to target to sell these products to? It's always very interesting to see what what the people want, because growing different things, if you can't get rid of them or if you can't sell them, then you're doing nothing. So it's it's interesting to see what it is the market wants from you. And, and to do that, you really need to get involved with your local community and find out what it is they want. And on these slides, you're going to see um, flowers and um, some of the displays that we set up on our farm and these are actual pictures and um, just sort of uh, um, samples of the products that we produce on our farm. Next slide. Okay, with your planning and your preparation, your market is going to be a reflection of your values. 
and it's going to take into account what type of farming practices you um, mm -hmm. you hold, whether you're going to farm organically, whether you're going to farm naturally, uh, whether you're looking at permaculture and you know trying to embrace the natural flow of things. You know when it comes to ecology. Um, the biggest thing you want to do is you want to work smarter and not harder. And the same goes into determining what it is that you want to grow. One of the things that you want to do first is test your soil. And you can work with your extension agent, um, and you can work with the Farm Service Agency Office, your NC NRCS mm -hmm. uh, agent, to have your soil tested. And we do a lot of preparation before we grow anything. It's always good to prepare your soil and to take a look at what it is you want to grow. Not only do we look at what we need to grow, we look at our irrigation systems to see exactly what each uh, the individual plant, whether it be a flower or a vegetable, what it needs. We look at the pH of the soil so there, there are so many different things that you have to consider when you're growing, uh, for, when you're growing different types of things. And you want to make sure that your your fruits and the vegetables that you want to grow are compatible for you, your region, as well as your soil. So you want to take in consideration what zone you're at. And the other thing you want to do is to read the soil packet. We call that RTSP. Um, because just because you want to grow uh, papaya doesn't mean that it's suitable for your climate. And the, the other thing that we take a look at when we look at those seed packets and other in, in, information is our zone. We, uh, here in Fredericksburg, Virginia, our zone is 7A, I believe, and we take a look at that to determine the time of season, uh, what we can grow during these seasons, and it really makes a lot of difference when you pay attention to the zones because not all zones are built for all year type of program. So um, that it really made a difference for us. The other thing that you wanted to keep in mind is what the farmers around you are growing. Um, it's great to have tomatoes, but if everybody grows tomatoes, you don't leave your customers a whole lot of options when you go to market. And especially as a small farmer, it's very important that to diversify. When people come to us and ask us what we grow, we tend to say that we grow from A to Z. We grow asparagus to zucchini. We try to have a mix of everything. We may not touch every alphabet, but we have a, a good mixture and um, diversification in what we produce. And it's always good to listen to what your customers want. Don't grow um, patty, patty squash when there's no market for it. You, you really need to listen to what the, your, your customers are saying. And here we found that a lot of people like the, the uh, squash, the yellow crooked neck squash, and it's easier for us to market that. And our market depends a lot on, as Anita stated, what we can grow. We can't compete with a lot of the large farms that grow two or 30 acres of tomatoes, but we can produce a variety of tomatoes that our customers are interested in. Okay. As far as farm location, that really does matter. If you're in a real rural community, then a farmer's market that's set up for a lot of farmers might be the route for you to go. We are very fortunate. We're located on a busy street. So we have, um, I guess six or seven housing developments, and each one of them has two, three hundred houses, you know, in each development that surround us. So we have the luxury of selling right there on our marketplace. Or we can go to one of the four markets that are located here in the Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania area. So location matters. Location does matter. Not only does the location matter, but it also matters that your farm can, you're in a place that can get appropriate sun. It's, it, your, your plants will need a lot of sunlight to grow, especially during the summer times. And when we saw 
And when Anita saw all these housing developments raising around us, she said, look at this, they're, they're closing in on us. And I said, be quiet, Anita. They're just creating our customers. So your outlook matters. The other thing that you wanna take into account, um, especially during this pandemic, is online sales. Uh, nobody saw the pandemic coming and it affected the marketplace tremendously. So it's almost to the point that if you don't have an online market, it's gonna be hard for you to reach a lot of customers. There were so many um, requirements during um, COVID-19 that a lot of farmers, that was the only way they could sell. So um, take that into account. Uh, Virginia State has wonderful programs that will work with you to teach you how to set up an online marketplace. The other thing to take into account is thinking about doing community supported agriculture. Some of the uh, boxes that you can put together and uh, sell as a group of farmers. So that you know one farm may be really small and can't handle a load, but if all of you go in uh, together cooperatively, that is um, a product that you can um, produce and be quite profitable at. The next thing that we'd like to highlight is education and experience. We started, um, as we said, not with farming backgrounds, but through Virginia State's program, we took a lot of uh, courses and got to the point that we felt comfortable putting seeds in the ground. Did we make mistakes? Of yes, course we did. Yes, we made we did. a lot of <laughs> mistakes, but we learned from them and we grew from them. And we now have experience that has taken us a long way. So never stop learning. Uh, farming is something that's um, going to constantly be growing. Uh, I think with this virus, people are now finding agriculture works. And uh, if you even go in the stores now, it's hard to find seeds. So um, make sure that you um, continue to grow and continue to learn. And then the other thing that I like to point out is to network with other farmers. That's something that we've done quite a bit. And um, I may not know how to grow the best okra, but I know a farmer who is an okra expert. So make those contacts. Don't be afraid to ask. The farming community is a very sharing community and um, you've got wonderful resources at Virginia State University that are always available to help you. Not only was it Virginia State University, but um, some of our other assets were uh, Virginia uh, Polytechnic Institute, uh, uh, Virginia, Tech. Virginia Tech. There was also the, uh, USDA, FSA, and NRCS. Um, can I give you the names of those? Because a lot of people just only think of uh, acronyms, but uh, NRCS stands for? Natural Resource Conservation Service. And FSA? Farm Service Agency. Yep, you see, she's my source. So we always think of all of our assets because these people will help you with your farm. But before you do anything, make sure your farm is registered with the USDA and the uh, Farm um, Service Agency. Farm Service Agency, yes. And they're, that's very, very important for you because if you don't use all of your assets as a farmer, then you're not gonna make it. Okay, the next thing is managing risk. As a small farming farmer, you know, risk are gonna happen. You're gonna have challenges. And the more that you plan and you prepare, the more you're gonna be able to manage risk. The weather, last week or this week, we had several storms. We lost trees, two trees on our farm, and they could have come down on some of our buildings and caused quite a bit of damage. Luckily, they did not. Uh, we still have a lot of cleanup that we need to do, but the weather is gonna be unpredictable. And um, as we've seen with COVID-19, things are gonna happen that you don't have any control of. But one of the things that we invite you to think about is investing in crop insurance. Uh, farming is not a, a cheap enterprise. And it's not an exact science. And with this COVID-19, now we, when people come to our farm, they used to uh, 
pick over the vegetables and touch them, but now we can't let them do that. So the, the way we market has certainly changed because we have to also not only protect ourselves, but protect our customers. Mm -hmm. And the next thing is starting small. We started small as, um, as farmers, although our property is 10 acres, it's just the two of us. So we uh, only farm about three acres and um, we're still able to be productive. Um, another reason why you wanna start small is because you don't want to lay, you know, have all your eggs in one basket, I guess that's mm -hmm. the best way to say it, or have one hen <clears throat> determining your total success on the farm, because that's when the fox is gonna come out and eat your hen. So think about diversification, start small, and then build on your successes. And when we started small, we really started small, and we just, we started with vegetables. And we found that by growing not only vegetables, but we, then we produced flowers. And when we did the flowers, some people would come by just to look at the beautiful flowers while we put squash and tomatoes and cucumbers in their bags. So it, it's, you know, everything that we do has been for a reason. And as we've grown our business slowly, we've also developed our business plan slowly and it's always good to have a business plan because you, that way you can keep a track of what you're spending and what you're making so things things in that nature you know it's it's no matter how much we love the vegetables it's a business and managing our risk as anita had stated before is not only about uh, different things that we can't predict like rain or shortage of rain, rain. you know you, you have to prepare your garden for stuff like that and that's why it's best to develop irrigation plans and if you fail to irrigate you fail to plan so you, you, you know we can't do that you have to develop a business plan that can survive different things that you're going to go through as a farmer and as farmers you're everything you're the engineer you're the mechanic, you're the plumber. You're, you're the marketer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of times you're the teacher because you've got to teach yourself um, a lot of stuff. So um, don't underestimate yourself and your abilities. Yep, keep growing, keep growing. Next slide, please. Okay, for those of you that are interested in um, cut flower production, these are some of the sources, resources that we recommend that you um, take advantage of. Whenever you're building a bouquet or a floral arrangement, I like to think of flowers as an art, just like a writer would do in writing a play. You're gonna have your main flowers, which are your major actors, and then you're gonna have your supporting flowers, which would be your greenery and your filler flowers. So one of the things that I like to do is use herbs like basil or mint, things that have great scents that will attract your butterflies and, and your bees to your garden. I like to use a lot of wildflowers, and then other things that we tend to use would be like your baby's breath. And sometimes I'll use accessories such as um, special ribbons, cards, and uh, wrapping sleeves. Next slide, please. Sorry about the phone. Again, when planning and preparation, once you get to the farmers, once you've learned how to produce and grow your produce properly, the next thing you want to do is think about your market. And going to the farmer's market, or before you even go to the farmer's market, you should think about visiting the farmer's market. But when you visit the farmer's market, think about it a little differently. Usually when you go to the farmer's market, you're there as a customer but you want to evaluate the sellers and you also want to get to know the market manager. 
some of the things that you would need to knew, know at the farmer's market is to how much are they going to charge you? Are you going to be willing to be at that market from October to, uh, from no, I'm sorry, from April to October every Saturday? That's a big commitment and that's something you want to think about. The other thing uh, at the farmer's market, you're going to need a tent. And when you get that tent, are you going to be able to set up that tent all by yourself if you're a sole um, farmer? I really recommend that you go to market with an additional person because you've got a lot of work ahead of you and we've done it. We um, were farmers at a farmer's market in Northern Virginia. And so you've got that commute for your preparation. You've got that tent that you've got to put up. The farmer's market usually opens up at seven o'clock in the morning and it usually runs until about one o'clock in the afternoon. So that's a sizable commitment of your time. Are you going to be able to harvest and create enough product to take to market to make a profit? And that's one of the things that we had considered uh, when we first started, uh, you know, what products we have. And then we uh, also developed, the, after we got into the honeybees, we would sell honey, but we also found another niche. And that was lip balms, soaps, all these things that could be made with honey. So we not and only- beeswax. Yeah, and, yeah, with the beeswax. And so we not only sold honey, we sold products that we could even take further and, and be more profitable. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the growth that we learned because we, we don't just stop where we, where we started. We have to progress and keep moving forward. So now we're finding that there are markets available that we had no idea were there. And people want these products. Mm -hmm. So you know, we've been very blessed to, to, you know, to find these things and keep going in whatever market at farmers markets or wherever we go, you know, we found that there are, there are things there that we can, can continue to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. The other thing, going back to the tent at the farmers market, the other thing that you'll need to do is have anchors for your tent. There will be windy days and your tent will blow away if the wind is significant enough. Oh, yes, it so will. you're going to have some type of anchor, usually uh, you're going to need to have sandbags sandbags mm -hmm. about uh, what, 20 pounds, 20 a, piece. pounds mm -hmm. a piece at each um, pole of your tent to keep that tent safe another thing you're going to need for the farmer's market is to have an, a sizable insurance policy liability insurance is very important for farmers and the farmer's market that we were at you had to have a million dollar liability policy so that is something that you'll, you'll need to have. And we're not going to endorse any particular insurance company. You'll have to research that for yourself. Mm -hmm. But we do recommend that you are insured. Right. And at the end, we're going to send, uh, provide you some links about the Virginia Farmers Market Association. And you can go there and do some research. The next thing that you want to do is make sure that you have um, have thought about how you're going to accept payment. Right now, change is a big issue uh, in the supermarkets and probably at the banks as well. So you're going to need to decide how you're going to accept payments, especially if you're going to go for cash. Um, with COVID-19, uh, there is a liability with accepting cash because you can also transfer the virus through coins and cash. So my recommendation is to accept electronic payments. There are different ways you can do that. Most people are familiar with Square, PayPal mm -hmm. is another resource that you can use. So do some research. And um, of course, with those two modes of electronic payment, there are fees associated with processing. Um, so you need to make yourself aware and understand how those type of payments will work. And if you're accepting payments electronically, it would behoove you to have a business bank account because you don't want to mix your personal finances 
with your business expenses because at the end of the year when you start doing your accounting and your taxes, you want to have clear lines of revenue of which one goes with which. And you also may want to set a, a minimum um, repay, payment thing when you're doing electronic payments uh, because sometimes your bank accounts and your comp card companies uh, will ask you for a percentage of your payment. So you may want to set on a payment, whereas you don't, you can't use a credit card unless it's a certain amount of money. I mean, this is all just marketing straight up and down. And, and if you can't, if you're going to lose money on a transaction, then don't make it. So, you know, you really need to consider that and talk to whoever your uh, bank account is with a uh, PayPal square, whoever, whatever, and find out how much you're paying so that you can set your prices appropriately. Okay. And as far as the business end of things, you also want to create uh, an employer identification number, which is also your, fa um, your federal tax identification number, so that when you go up to set up your business banking account, you'll have all that information together. And you can go to probably the, um, what's it called? The, It'll come to me. The business association. What's it called? I am not sure. What you're It'll come about. to me. I'm sorry. I'm having one of those those moments, a senior moment. Um, as I said earlier, having an assistant will help. COVID safety is a big thing at the farmers market, and your farmers manager, market manager, will help you understand what kind of signs you need to have posted and the things that you need to do to stay um, safe at the farmer's market. Next slide, please. Um, before I go into the next slide, one of the things that I um, just thought about is at the end of every farmer's market, you need to evaluate um, your procedures and think about the things that went well that day and the things that could have done better. The other thing that while you're at the farmer's market, observe the other farmers that are there and find out the things or just kind of notice the things that are drawing people into their booth. It's never too late to shift and adjust your marketing strategy. So flattery is, you know, copying something that somebody else is doing is probably one of the greatest sources of flattery. And um, if they're doing something right and it's something that you can do, you know, go ahead and do that. Okay. As far as your flowers, just like your, your produce, you want to look at the varieties and learn how to grow those things properly. Look at those seed packets and follow the instructions to the T. If you do that and test your soil, you're going to be guaranteed to have some beautiful flowers. Also look at, um, the flowers that are going to grow anywhere over, I guess, 12 inches tall, you'll probably need some type of uh, floral support, like floral netting, in order to get those stems to grow straight. Um, and I provided you there a link to how to use floral netting. Also grow flowers for the appropriate season. There are some flowers like larkspur and sweet peas that don't like a lot of heat. And then there are flowers that like the zinnias that you're going to have go throughout the summer. And the more you cut them, the more they're going to come back. Mm -hmm. Just like with your, your vegetables, the same thing applies for your flowers. You want to plant for, six, for succession. You don't want all of your crops coming into full bloom all at the same time. If everything comes into bloom and you can't sell everything all at the same time on that, that market day, you're going to lose money. So you want things constantly blooming throughout your growing season or your market season. Next slide, please. Okay, we've talked about um, ways to accept payment. Um, I guess the main thing that I want to end with as far as this slide is concerned is to find your niche. Find the thing that's going to set you apart from all the other farmers at the market 
and bring customers into your booth. One of the things that I did was I created, I don't know if you can see this, a mini bouquet. And it allowed me to recycle some of the cans, you know, from my pantry and create a small bouquet that um, people could kind of fit in their car, in their uh, drink and, holder. And they laugh, but they call out this arrangement the Del Monte special. <laughs> so we, so we, you know, we, we constantly try to think of ways that we can. And I called it sunshine in a can. Mm -hmm. And it was very popular at the market and it sold, you know, rapidly. And determining what you grow and when you grow it is always going to be an important aspect of your farming. Uh, if you think you can grow parsley and there is a market for the parsley, then grow the parsley. But don't just grow things arbitrarily. You need to think about what it is you're growing and is it marketable. And we've, we've experienced a lot of things that we thought would be good, but they weren't. And then some of the things that we took for granted that were just huge success. So a lot of times you'll learn, you'll learn by growing and continue to grow and find out what it is your market wants. And when you order your seeds, you need to order them as a needed state at this year because of the COVID virus. There's been a lot of people that have uh, flooded the market at requiring seeds because they want to grow their own gardens. And I think that's an awfully good thing uh, that people want to grow their own gardens. But remember, whatever it is you think you need, you need to grow it and you need to get those seeds early. It's always better to get your seeds early before you go to market. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about harvesting. Next slide, please. Okay. Once you plant it, you really need to focus on um, how you're going to get things from the field into your marketplace. Mm -hmm and where you're going to store them. And the harvest, the, you want to the talk harvest about is a very important time because not only when you harvest, you're not just picking the stuff out of the field. What you're doing is actually preparing it for your customers. And when you do that, you want this to be nutritious, not only nutritious, you want this to be healthy. And by doing that, you don't want to cause them to have any type of germs. So it's very important the way you grow it and the way you, you harvest. harvest. So, and you want to make sure that <clears throat> if you're harvesting something like okra, that your, your knives, your scissors, whatever you're harvesting, all the instruments are sanitized between each harvest and sterilized if you can. Same thing with the baskets that you harvest in. You want to make sure that the baskets are sanitized between harvest. And then once it's harvest, you want to allow, if it's a hot summer day, you've got to allow the field heat to come down before you store it in refrigeration. Um, because without allowing things to uh, cool properly, you can introduce mold and bacteria into the process. So the harvest is a very, very, very important aspect of farming. Uh, it's not just about picking and, and walking down the rows and throwing it in a bag. It's about doing it safely because the one thing you have to consider is your customers and the safety of the families that you're feeding. Because you do want repeat customers. Next slide, please. These are the rules for harvesting your cut flowers. Please get up early in the morning. When I'm going to market and I'm um, harvesting flowers, I usually get up anywhere between 5.30 and 6 o'clock in the morning to do the harvesting because that's when your flowers are going to be fully hydrated, the temperatures are going to be low, the sun's not going to be beating on you, and your flowers are going to last longer. Um, my cut flowers, I've had customers come and say they had the same flowers in a vase for over a week. 
because the flowers were so well hydrated and taken care of. I make sure that my instruments are clean and sanitized. I usually use bleach or some type of bleaching product to clean them. I always make sure that all my buckets are thoroughly clean. And when you're harvesting your flowers, you always want to cut just above the, um, where the two um, leaves come together and cut at a 45 degree angle. And that will allow the water uptake um, to flow freely. And it's not only the water that you have to prepare. What we do with the flowers when we collect them is we put them in a solution and the solution contains a little bit of vinegar, uh, some uh, well, soda, uh, sugar, soda water. sugar water, and, uh, and some sometimes other... I'll mm -hmm. just put bleach in there. Yeah. Because but... you want to minimize um, bacteria because that's what's going to clog up the flower um, and we cut the Channels. leaves, we cut the leaves off the portion that goes down into to the, the water, water to prevent bacterial From infections. So mm -hmm. the, that's one of the reasons that the flowers seem to last longer is because we care about what we're doing and we want the flowers to be good for our customers because if the, if the flowers die the next day, they're not coming back. So we always try to make sure that our flowers are well taken care of and we also dump them or dump them, excuse me, in water uh, to try and get rid of insects and things of that nature. Because we don't use pesticides or herbicides. So yeah, there will be spiders hiding under leaves. So you want to try to make sure that you don't have any exactly. unpleasant surprises at exactly. the market. Yeah. The other thing that you want to make note of is you never store your flowers with your produce. Flowers emit ethylene gas and it'll cause your produce to ripen quickly. So mm -hmm. it won't last very long. So flowers and vegetables are two things that don't go together as far as long-term storage or any type of storage. Next slide, please. As we mentioned earlier, you should always store your flowers in clean buckets, filled with some type of preservative to counteract any type of bacteria that could possibly form. You also want to store them away from sunlight because if you're, um, you've got blooms that haven't opened up completely and when you cut your sunflowers, you don't want them completely open. If they're stored in sunlight, they're going to open up quickly. And I mentioned cutting at a 45 degree angle to increase that water intake. Remember, your flowers are living things as well as your vegetables. And a lot of them, they require water, constant fresh water. Mm -hmm. And when you can provide them with that water, even at the 45 degree angle, it, it helps them live longer. Mm -hmm. So you, that's what you want. And you want to all, you always want your produce whether it's vegetables or flowers, you want it to live as long as it can. And for that, it needs fresh, clean water. And with our farm, we uh, also test our water annually. And we have a deep well, uh, but we still test the water annually to make sure that we're not introducing anything bad. And we encourage all farmers to do the same thing, to, to test your water. And if you're using an open, water source such as a pond or something of other a river then you need to test you probably need to test more often but with a closed deep well we only are required to test annually but you can check with your local state organization to find out about water testing in your area okay next slide please Okay, again, planning and preparation, we can't overemphasize it. Um, we've talked about a lot of these um, items and uh, we hit on pricing and uh, making sure that you can accept uh, electronic payments. We talked about your EIN, 
which is your employee identification number, also known as your federal tax number. And the big thing is trying to figure out how you're going to stand out in, in your marketplace. And one of the other things I think we didn't talk about in pricing is you need to set a price that you can make a profit. If you're if you are going to sell squash, then you need to make sure that you've allowed for your seed costs, your fertilizer, your fertilizer costs, your soil preparation, your irrigation. You need to put all of that in your business plan to determine if you're going to sell this squash, can you make a profit? If you're going to sell the zinnias or the flowers, you, you need to make a profit. So what you need to do is take a look at all the things that you put in and determine how much money you need to get out of it. And once you determine how much you need to get out of it, that's where you're going to set your price. If your price is so high that you can't compete with the local market, then you may need to look at another type of produce. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, and he talked a lot about the pricing. And here I'm going to ask Mark to bring up some of the links. These are things that you can consider in creating your price. The first one is the VDAX um, price sheet. Many people don't realize that, but VDAX will go to the farmer's market and take the average prices for produce and goods sold um, throughout Virginia. And as you can see in the middle, there's the Charlottesville market. And they also do it based on whether your produce is organic or if you just grow naturally or, you know, the traditional with pesticides and all that. So there are different ways for you to look at um, prices to help you understand what goods are selling for in your local area. And we also use this and keep this on hand so that when people come to us and say, oh, you're selling your, your cucumbers for 75 cents a piece. Well, I can go to Aldi and get them for 65. Well, you show them this and then you tell them in a very polite way, you know, those cucumbers probably came from someplace in South America they don't have any regulations like we have here in America as far as safety for pesticides and herbicides. So if you want to go to Aldi and, and eat that 65 cent cucumber, do so at your own not, risk. Not just, all, <laughs> not just Aldi, but we found that here in uh, Spotsylvania County, a cucumber may be 25 cents, but when we go up to Potomac um, near uh, Potomac Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. that that same cucumber, when we tell them it's 75 cents, they say, oh, it's on sale. So there's a huge difference also in the location of marketing. It's not just any particular store, and we're not going to condemn Aldi or any other store mm -hmm. as far as their produce, because uh, um, that's probably not an appropriate thing to do. But what we can say is that the location of your market is really good, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the produce that you have, it's depending on how you're marketing your material, if it's organic, if it's naturally grown, or if it's just, just grown. So you have to consider all those things in your marketing price. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mark, if you could show the next link, please. Okay, also USDA has prices for your flowers and usually they're um, determined by bunches or either stems. So as you can see on the second, on the third listing, the, um, or the Astromeria is sold in bunches of 10 and their average price for this particular market, which is in Boston, is $8.50 a bunch. So you can also go to that website. They also give you telephone numbers 
Um, you can call and see if they have something closer to your area, to the Virginia area, that will help you set some prices. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, one of the things that I developed is for our farm is a checklist of items that we needed to take to market. I realized early on that when we were going to market in Northern Virginia, we were getting up sometimes at like five o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. I am not always totally alert that time in the morning and I operate better if I have a checklist. And these are some of the items that I included on my checklist that I needed to know that I had ready to load on the truck before we went to market. So I encourage you to develop something similar so that you don't forget your Square or your PayPal or your change um, to make sure you have some type of checklist. And before we go any further, I must state that Botanical Bites and Provisions LLC does not uh, dislike Aldi or any of, st of the other stores. Uh, so we're sorry that we mentioned any store by name. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, as far as your floral supplies, here, here's a list of some supplies that I would recommend that you have on hand if you plan on being a cut flower grower. Um, sunscreen is probably number one on my list because a lot of times when you're out there working your flowers, it's going to be a very hot day. Gloves, of course, um, kneeling pads, and I love my rolling garden seat. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, we had mentioned earlier that when you're um, storing and transplanting, you're transporting your flowers, um, temperature is very critical to flowers. And it, if you're doing something for market, if you harvest them the morning of, usually and and get them to market usually that's going to be fine if you you know have an air conditioned vehicle but if you're going to have flowers cut and you're going to store them for longer these are the ideal temperatures that we recommend that you have your flowers um, stored in and as well as having them in some type of hydrating solution if you expect to have something that's going to be sellable and it's going to last mm -hmm. um, at the market. And most vegetables usually in the 40 degree uh, range, 40 degree Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. uh, they, they usually love that around that temperature. But you never want to put your vegetables in anything uh, near 32 degrees uh, because that, they're degrees. not going to last. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, on the next slide, we're going to try to show you a video that we created on making and building a bouquet that's appropriate for the farmer's market. Look like that's working. Make simple bouquets appropriate for selling at the farmer's market. I have already picked flowers from my farm. And before we get started, let's talk about some of the equipment that you might want to have on hand before you start making bouquets. Some of the things that you're going to need include your floral shears, of course, your containers of water, which I've got here, rubber bands for banding your flowers together, or either twine 
sometimes I'll use the twine as I use the wrapping to make a decorative um, package along with ribbon. That's something else that you can use. And sometimes little accessories to kind of bring your bouquet to life. Okay. And then here are some of the other accessories and uh, items that I use. I always have a bottle brush to clean out my buckets. Oh, oops. Sorry about that. Didn't do the screen share. What happened? It didn't do the screen share. Can you see it? Mark, can you see it? Oh, and welcome to my bouquet making class. I'm Anita Robertson from Botanical Lights and Provisions, and it's my pleasure to be with you today and show you how to make simple bouquets appropriate for selling at the farmer's market. I have already picked flowers from my farm and before we get started, let's talk about some of the equipment that you might want to have on hand before you start making bouquets. Some of the things that you're going to need include your floral shears, of course, your containers of water, which I've got here, rubber bands for banding your flowers together, or either twine. Sometimes I'll use the twine as I use the wrapping to make a decorative um, package. Sorry, could you, could you try to share it one more time? And sometimes little accessories. Hello, and welcome to my bouquet okay. making. Okay. No, just hit the button. I, did, I don't, we hear the audio, but no video. Okay. There it goes, there you go. Got okay, it. thank you. Sorry about the video. Mm -hmm class. I'm Anita Robertson from Botanical Lights and Provisions, and it's my pleasure to be with you today and show you how to make simple bouquets appropriate for selling at the farmer's market. I have already picked flowers from my farm, and before we get started, let's talk about some of the equipment that you might want to have on hand before you start making bouquets. Some of the things that you're going to need include your floral shears, of course, your containers of water, which I've got here, rubber bands for banding your flowers together, or either twine. Sometimes I'll use the twine as I use the wrapping to make a decorative um, package along with ribbon. That's something else that you can use and sometimes little accessories to kind of bring your bouquet to life. Okay. And then here are some of the other accessories and uh, items that I use. I always have a bottle brush to clean out my buckets afterwards. And I usually clean out my buckets with bleach. As you can see over here, I've got bleach and can I scoot around you? I also have hydrating solution. Uh, quick dip is one. Finishing touch. And there's my bleach. Because you want to make sure that your buckets and your instruments are thoroughly clean to prolong the life of your flowers. Now we're gonna build our bouquet. I like to build my bouquet like a artist would do in writing a play. You've got to think of your flowers um, very creatively. You've got primary actors, you've got primary flowers. You have supporting actors, you've got supporting flowers, uh, like the, your greenery. This would be an exocelosia, um, the plume celosia would be an accessory uh, flower, a filler flower, as would 
these wildflowers that you find commonly alongside of the roads in Virginia. I also use status, this white flower here, and um, some of your shorter flowers, uh, this comfrenia makes a very nice um, flower along with these ornamental grasses. So I'm going to come over here. Okay. I'm going to reach over here and grab one of my sunflowers. And this is going to be my central flower. Uh, to surround the sunflower, I'm going to use some of these snapdragons. And if you notice, some of the snapdragons have um, blooms that are beyond their prime. I'm just simply going to pluck those off. Grab another stem. Oops. Now I'm going to come over here, get some of my zinnias. interest and I'm going to get some of these filler flowers As you can see, we've got a nice bouquet here. I'm going to eliminate some of these petals because you don't want the petals in the water. And which one piece? Another one to balance on this side. Are you still filming? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want it high. It's for emphasis. They don't. Everything doesn't have to be at the same level. because you want your bouquet. to fit in the sleeves. You want to be able to get your rubber band around everything. Okay. 
and then you can always readjust. Like right here seems empty, so we can add another sunflower or some other flowers. Thank you. Any questions? And um, on the next slide, let's see, do I need to... Anita, there was one question about if you could just kind of go into how you go about washing the flowers of bugs. Are you submerging the entire flower in water and for how long? Okay, could you repeat that question again? So the question was when you're getting bugs off your flowers, are you submersing the whole flower and for how long if so? Um, I just kind of dip it. Um, I guess different flower growers do different things. Um, do you want to share what you do, Susan, with yours? I just dip mine. In a Clorox solution. And it's sort of like a Clorox solution. Often when you refrigerate them to chill the flowers before they go out, you've taken care of the bugs and just gently kind of brush the bugs off. Or you can gently rinse them. It just depends on what you're growing. I think sunflowers are ants are the probably the biggest problem. Ants, yes. <laughs> Any more questions? If not, um, the next slide, Mark, I've got some references, I believe. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, the Virginia Farmers Market uh, Association has a wealth of information that's available on their website and their website's posted in blue. So I encourage you to go there. They um, have links to all the markets all throughout Virginia and um, tremendous resources for every farmer to use. And that concludes the presentation. We thank you for joining us today and hope that our experiences that we've shared, and here's some more um, references. Thank you, Mark. Um, some articles that I found online that are, um, were really great that helped me to put this uh, presentation together. And lastly, YouTube videos. They have tremendous resources out there too for um, both cut flower growers and vegetable producers. Thank you, and come see us. <laughs> Do you want to just give a couple minutes for any questions, if anybody else had any other questions? Yes, we do. Just looking at the chat. Okay. I think we're we're done. Anything else? I'm just waiting to see on the Facebook feed because they show up at different than your chat. Oh, okay. Uh, they want to know if the slides are going to be shareable. Uh, Virginia State said that they were going to make the slides available, the entire presentation, and I can always, um, I've already emailed the uh, presentation to Susan and Mark. Yes, we can do that. And we'll also have this on the, on our YouTube channel. 
this video and then I think in the links so we can put uh, the links to every all the documents that you talked about in this presentation. And that that should be up in about two weeks or so. Thank you. Mark, are there more slides at the end? There's plenty one up 23. I think the last slide oh, is basically it's just, uh, on contact information. Mm -hmm. and I think, um, one more. Just give oh. that a minute to come up so they can see those last couple. Mm -hmm. That's the last slide. 